Hello everyone, today we talk about the Carolingian domination of Italy, a topic that we never addressed before in a dedicated video and that therefore today we will approach only from a political, strategical point of view, making some points that can help introduce. Um, I will make also another general introduction to the Carolingian kingdom of Italy as such and then we will also descend hopefully several other uh, details in, in various videos. This is the first time we discuss it, um, therefore we will try to, to see things broadly uh, enough as a, as a background. So, you know what we're talking about. Uh, the Carolingian conquest of the Longobard Kingdom was one of the most uh, important events politically and uh, strategically in the history of high medieval Europe, essentially the Franks managed to secure their um, Mediterranean position in uh, conflict with the Byzantines more than even the same Longobards that had uh, at a point uh, weakened to to the point of giving way to, to the Carolingians and especially for the connection with the papacy that had called in fact the Franks, they were former Longobard allies um, to defend the so-called Patrimonium Sancti Petri in, in central Italy um, from the effective expansion that Longobards were carrying out after having knocked out the Rabinate Exarchate and having factually almost unified the, the entire uh, peninsula, having showed also some interest uh, in Provence, that is something we incidentally discussed about the kingdoms of Burgundy uh, in, um, especially after the St. Carolingian partitions that saw Italy actually acquiring, especially the, the southernmost part of Provence, the one of Arles and the mouth of the Rhone, as a general, you know, uh, historical direction. Think about St. Theodoric uh, conquering the land back in the day of the Ostrogoths uh, and so on. And uh, the Carolingian conquest of Italy was the event that effectively secured the revival of the Roman Empire in the West as a broader uh, accomplishment of the Carolingian dynasty to essentially uh, take over most of uh, Central Europe and uh, therefore also uh, becoming the new moving force uh, of, of the West in a truly universal uh, direction and we can't digress on nor stressing enough uh, how you know fruitful this uh, event really was even though of course at, at the time this brought mm, severe distress also in the conquered lands today we don't talk m much about Italian society at this point but of course the Carolingian conquest was brutal Right, it didn't bring to, you know, um, massacres, deportations, kind of uh, the, the destruction of a, of a pre-existent establishment. On the contrary, the Carolingians had a very high opinion of the Longobards, were essentially the only people in Europe that they considered as, um, as, as their peers, literally, um, for many reasons that had to do also with, with the different way that, that the, the Longobards had dealt with the process of Christianization and, and Romanization that the Franks liked uh, in a sense more more traditionally than than their own solution uh, in a sense um, and also because this state was was a real state right the, the Longobard kingdom in spite of all the uh, garbage that was written in the 19th century that most people still swallow um, without any care uh, was factually, yes, the single most advanced Latin Germanic kingdom at the time was a functional elective monarchy based on a, on a urban administration, literate public officials uh, that were competing within the same, uh, the same in, in monarchic institutions and not essentially just as private forces you would find in the same Carolingian war, which is the reason why that, that the, the empire eventually imploded on itself uh, again, we're not talking about, in fact, the massive cultural legacy that the same Italic kingdom represented. The fact that, at least from an imperial point of view, it contained the uh, it contained Rome, 
right? Light, as you know, the papacy thought of itself is not part of, of any of any empire. I made also a video, a uh, question and answer video about that uh, topic. I was asked, um, and many other issues, including. In fact, this high standards in ecclesiastical cultural administration that the, the especially Charlemagne and, and Louis de Pius were quite eager to introduce um, north of the Alps to to try in the effort of in fact of centralizing more their own power. So um, at the same time as we were saying at the beginning, the Carolingians uh, were, however, to secure this region also from the neighboring. Uh, powers that were not uh, particularly threatening altogether, but that were still significantly backed by, especially in the south of the peninsula, by the Byzantines that were not happy at all of the Carolingians acquiring this, this great power, right? But we can speak of other provincial realities such as the Avars, the Slavs uh, in the east. And we'll analyze briefly all of these things uh, in a while. Um, the the same Carolingian conquest of Italy had been a major strategic feat. I mean, the, there was a, a massive logistical organization for carrying out the um, the two Alpine crossings by two distinct um, armies and essentially uh, eluding the uh, the in crashing actually the the Longobard uh, resistance and defense with the, of the in fact the royal army the Alpine fortifications. The siege of Pavia, the Longobard capital, um, lasted nine months, right? And this is the longest siege in Carolingian military history, a testament also of the uh, massive urbanization that uh, existed in in the Longobard kingdom compared um, to, to the rest of, uh, of Carolingian Europe. And as you know, in a broader sense, the Italic crown would be attached in the Holy Roman Empire to the same imperial uh, title that is to say you couldn't be emperor without having received the italic crown it was more even more important institutional in this sense than say uh, another ethnic crown you could be say interior king of the western Franks as it happened with Charles the Bald and becoming king of Italy eventually um, the Germans secured uh, the title so that the eater of king of Germany king of the Romans and king of Italy would open to to the imperial one, um, but uh, the most important thing in absolute, like the conditio sine qua non, was the Italic crown, right? Even a French king, say, could be emperor, and he been, uh, uh, in fact, Longobard king, Italic king. There would be a lot to tell about this whole story. I made several videos about long the Longobards, but we never well much in the later Longbird history nor on how the, the Carolingian conquest occurred generally speaking we look at the at the macroscopic evidence I mean the fact that not just you know the Italic kingdom was essentially the Po Valley in Tuscany extensionally was part of you know the other tire of the, of the Carolingian uh, Empire but the Carolingians had developed um, essentially a professional military elite that had dramatically increased the overall hierarchy and discipline of, of the entire uh, military system. And aside, of course, also from the massive, but I mean massive agricultural and demographic capacities of the vast Atlantic plains over which the, uh, the Franks ruled, they could afford, in fact, to, to take over, uh, not just, like in this case, Italy, but, as you know, many other areas of Europe, from uh, from from Catalonia to, to Saxony. Uh, another massive logistical feat was the destruction of the Avar Cagani. It doesn't matter how weakened that power really was. Longobards were, were just in the norm of, of an average Latin Germanic power. Like, they had uh, uh, the older... Mm, uh, Romano-Germanic levy system integrated with some sort of semi-professional uh, clientele, also some kind of royal connection, but it was much more of a civil than a military power, right? And um, that's the thing that also the, the Carolingians were looking to, to for to integrate uh, in their own system 
to, to great benefit. So after the Frankish conquest, the Longobard kingdom survived as a distinct state. This is yet another important feature that uh, stresses the importance of the Italic kingdom. As we'll see now, Charlemagne became king of the Franks and of the Longobards. There was no such uh, thing uh, with the other, I don't know, with the Burgundians, the Alamanni, any other people that had been subjugated of the, uh, by the Franks had not remained a kingdom and uh, the Franks had not taken over kind of a, uh, their own crown in order to elevate uh, the, the local polity to, to that important role. Um, this, uh, however, still happened, as we were saying at the very beginning, at the price of uh, losing the Longobard National Foundation, right? Uh, the kingdom was, yes, the kingdom of the Longobards, but as we will see, this is also where properly the name of the Italic kingdom came about, and the, the, the terminology was very political uh, and quite, uh, quite relevant also regarding the international status of, of the kingdom, and we'll address this now in a while as well. Um, the Longobards had been conquered, right? So by right of conquest, this land now was Carolingian, and the Carolingians cared, in fact, uh, particularly about this. The papal role, as we have seen, was quite crucial in all this because uh, it had been the Roman pontiff to have called the Carolingians in Italy since the time of Pippin uh, the Short, and so uh, there was a, a good generation uh, th during which essentially the, the, the Franks had been testing the permeability of the Longobard kingdom and uh, invaded the country without occupying it uh, multiple times. Um, so by the time of the Carolingian conquest, that as, as we've seen also presented an important degree of, of resistance, uh, the, um, the, the Longobard kingdom had effectively already become a sort of Frankish client state of sort. Um, and this was put in by, again, many political and social dynamics for which were even Longobards that fled in, in France before uh, the conquest, because they realized the storm was coming in a sense. The, the role of the papacy was the most, um, you know, uh, let's say the most ideological in many ways, because of course the Longobards were, were actually very good Catholics by that point. They were, they were trying to to take over Rome, they besieged it uh, multiple times in their history, and at this point they had been renewing pressure, but within the same Rome there were actually like uh, a pro-Longobard and anti-Longobard faction, and had the pro-1-1, there would have been probably a Longobard in integration of the, of, of the papacy in their, in their kingdom, something very different, of course, of how events unfolded historically, and uh, the St. Carolingian Empire was somewhat a matter of, uh, of, of chance because, you know, hadn't, I don't know, biologically speaking, had there been, you know, the, the sole survival of, of Charlemagne or Louis the Pius um, paired to their siblings, uh, the, the unity of the same empire, as you know, would have been split. And that's also what the events uh, of the following generations really showed. And also Italy, as you know, came to be to, to remain a, a unity in all this and with the major distinction of Western Francia and Eastern Francia, also Burgundy as we've seen uh, recently. Um, so what happened now was to define a great deal of um, European history for you know for centuries to come. Um, Pope Hadrian in had uh, attempted in the process of the Carolingian conquest to dismember the same Longobard kingdom, right, in order to place a major portion of it under papal authority. Charlemagne, however, did not carry out the papal request, and indeed in 781, so just after seven years, the, the, the conquest uh, of the kingdom, he had uh, the same pope anoint his son, Charlemagne's son, Pippin as king of the Longbirds, albeit uh, Pippin was at the time only four years old. 
this was a very significant move from Charlemagne. The deal of the church was that, in theory, uh, the, the Frankish Papal Alliance would have had to split Italy into kind of some spheres of influence, uh, because this traditional papal goal was to essentially claim the entire uh, Italy up to essentially the Adige River in the north and uh, the Messina Strait in the south as its own its own dominion, St. Peter's dominion, and except uh, at, at that time the, the papacy didn't have the, the the military capacity to 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 control actually much beyond Rome directly, right? But the idea of having uh, an authority like Charlemagne to say confirm the confer this you know privilege this this uh, dominion recognition to the Roman Church over over essentially the entire Italy uh, was the the great papal dream that was never achieved even though um, this uh, problem dragged on for centuries and, and centuries right um, the entire especially the rivalry with the Ravenna it was still uh, a powerful archdiocese um, that competed with Rome also fiercely and um, the so there was also the old the Byzantine legacy there the uh, the the ambiguity existing regarding the the, the spheres of influence properly on, on a temporal and spiritual level of the empire and the papacy respectively something that would wouldn't be solved ever uh, in a in a definitive sense at least conceptually right you know that we find up to the 13th century still the papacy claim those parts of the the Romagnol area of and beyond right in the north because in theory that's how far the papacy would have liked to go also still regarding southern Italy even Sicily uh, as uh, you know some sort of uh, preferential land and a sort of of beneficium as it would happen for the Normans that were literally entrusted invested by the, the papacy with the uh, the kingship of Sicily as a literally as a feudal relation as you know is is quite um, interesting and uh, instructive about this but today we'll not talk about the, the papacy we'll talk about the Carolingian papal relationship in this case is in another video because they're very complex and um, as interesting and so they deserve more what we see here is more like the imperial perspective and so what were the concrete needs of the Carolingians to actually instead occupy uh, the, the country and to keep it functional and to you know secure this this major regional uh, reality as also one of the most prestigious or if not the most prestigious as a matter of fact in the uh, in the world at that time because again the same as we'll see now kind of uh, Italianness as opposed to Longobertness of, of the of the of the re royal title was a very significant shout out against Constantinople because it aimed at the entire peninsula uh, if not even beyond because as you know the Carolingians were expanding also in the east in areas like Istria um, and so the same think about the same Venice I mean the same Pippin of Italy the son of Charlemagne actually died of malaria during the imperial siege of the Duchy of Venice uh, so there was think about Irene and all the, the chances even of reuniting east and west in the process so a very big game the same Longobards had actually resumed this one of one of the Longobard titles was mm, literally uh, Grazia Dei Regis Totius Italia since a very since the the seventh century even probably before to stress that 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 geographical horizon was the one they saw now ruling on even though there were in fact the Byzantines there so it was a very powerful um, you know a uh, very powerful political uh, objective that they were illustrating uh, with that and factually succeed in it because you know the Longobards had had the, the upper hand in Italy since the, the at least the early seventh century and gradually they were ousting practically all all the Byzantine control on the peninsula before the Carolingian conquest happened. So that's yet another very interesting chapter. 
and we will probably make some video comparisons and say, or at least, you know, that I don't like what ifs, but uh, it's important to assess also the, in that regard, the, especially the order of the Longobard Kingdom, the fact that absolutely um, in an opposite direction to what was previously believed by historiography, there was no kind of internal fracture by any degree, like the, the Longobard crown was recognized by all the uh, Longobard dukes at all times, that the only squishy ones being more the, the dukes of Spoleto, that as we'll see actually ha would have a, a vital role exactly in this sense, also in the relation with, with, the, with the papacy, these were actually the weakest of all the various duchies, but they had a very significant political and strategic, especially strategic relevance as they controlled the Apennine passes exactly between uh, Ravenna and Rome, um, and uh, that also, you know, at the time of the Carolingian conquest gave themselves to the to the papacy, right? They abandoned their own distinctive Longobard haircut, and, and they adopted the Roman one as a proof of their, okay, kind of, we give up, we don't try anything, we'll just put ourselves under the papal protection. It's a bit like uh, the same Duke of, of Benevent would do at the time of the Norman conquest, right? So much that Benevent, as you know, would remain an island of papal states territorially and politically within, a bit like Avignon, right? Uh, in another in another entity. Now, um, there was also an intrinsic conflictuality between the new, mm, say, actually the old allies, the papacy and, and the Franks, Right, uh, this thing of the Italian intervention was completely new in the broader historical scale of things. Yes, the, the Franks at the end of the, uh, of the 6th century had, had invaded actually the, the Po Valley when the Longobards had occupied it together with the Byzantines. They had always maintained kind of the upper hand by controlling, you know, beyond the, the Alpine watershed from, from the Italian side, in fact. Um, as the greatest power, right? A bit like the Longobards were in comparison compared to the Bavarians um, in in the north. Um, so the idea that this broader kind of Frankish Longobard conflictuality had not been dealt with yet was a thing, right? But it, it was you know, demo day in a way, like, again, mostly th these powers were allies, the same Pippin the Short called uh, the Longobard king Lutbrand to, to assist him militarily in Provence against the Saracens back in the day. We know the vicissitudes of the Franks, mostly the aforementioned problem posed by the dynastic split that occurred at every generation. So it was obvious in a sense that as the, since, uh, since you see the, the, I mean, Justinian's Reconquest, I made videos about this, explaining the so-called Atlantic perspective, like this massive Western Reconquest, most mostly aimed, but just, of course, at primarily, of course, reconquering the most Romanized and still functional lands in a late antique perspective, but also countering the Merovingians back in the day, uh, because that would have been, the, you know, the Mediterranean would have been their their primary goal. Right, so what happens in these times is exactly with the reactivation of Europe, the Mediterranean, etc., the, the economical, demographic revival that all these powers had witnessed, the capacity of expanding again was um, was translated again into this essentially Frankish versus Byzantine thing. Right, so this broader thing dated to the hostility that existed between this kind of Initially, it had been a pagan Aryan axe, uh, axis. We have talked about it. Central Europe, um, peoples like the Thuringians, uh, etc., the, the Bavarians, that in fact had remained a bit, even though uh, they were actually a Frankish creation, like more siding with the Longobards than the Franks during the period of the contraction of the Merovingian monarchy, when factually, in fact, the same Longobard kingdom was the the. The, the strongest um, Christian power in the West, um, but had included the Ostrogoths, right, and and the Visigoths as well, but still the, with the centrality of Italy with Theodoric at the time. So it was a, a big deal, right, and still the Byzantine presence was crucial because most of the southern uh, Italian and um, an important deal of 
especially the islands and some coastal areas, were, were, had still a, a big deal of Byzantine influence, right? And albeit the the Longbirds had historically been enemies with with the with the empire. In fact, now, as we will see, especially the position of Benevent was never quite fully controlled by the Carolingians posed some broader regional scale issues that we will we will talk about. Um, Charlemagne kept the Longbert royal title for himself. Right? Uh, his son Pippin, when he was crowned, he was four, in this sense was a sort of sub-king, but still showing that the emperor of 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 Rome and the Frankish king was also a Longbert king, and that was a big deal. Um, so Pippin initially was just um, the sense of figurehead for the Carolingian administration in Italy. Later, however, as an adult, Pippin was an alert and energetic executor of instructions which came nevertheless from his father. He was a very good king. In fact, it was kind of a pity that he died um, and the Carolingians, as you know, were not particularly lucky uh, in all their uh, in their in their future. Um, but he had already, you know, exemplified the, the the effective rule that the Carolingians had in in Italy, the subordination of the Longobard Kingdom to the convenience of Carolingian politics and strategic considerations was in fact so firmly entrenched that in the Divisio Regnorum of 806 Charlemagne decreed that should Pippin die the kingdom of Italy was to be divided between his two other sons thus mm, uh, clarifying uh, how uh, deeply personal the Italian possession was and how it would perfectly fit as a, in fact, a dynastic uh, kingdom to be split among the, the Carolingian blood, right? And so fully comparticipating to the, the destinies of the imperial family. However, the kingdom would not be divided up right and this was a fortune in many ways because um like the 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 broader unity of of the kingdom was uh, very functional for the local administration that had been structured historically for that unity right um it would have been also complicated, especially the real core, so Lombardy and Tuscany, also partly Liguria, uh, was the, in fact, the most, uh, not just the most developed, but also the closest one to to Francia. Thus, the, the, the peripheral areas, the ones were also a bit more of kind of Longobard identity, as we'll see now, survived in a, uh, in a resilient sense, uh, as opposed to the the foreign domination would have placed, uh, like you know, an eventual Carolingian ruler uh, that getting that part from the split relatively isolated and um, somewhat uh, you know exposed to 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 invasions, to uprisings, and a contained power. But things went differently because by 813, so just one year before uh, Charlemagne's death. I, I made a video, incidentally, um, uh, some weeks ago about Charlemagne's precepts to his son. Um, well, Louis, who was in fact the, the only one alive at that point, um, and that was sharing, by the way, in that year his father's imperial title, um, was, uh, was prepared for the succession in as a sole ruler of the Carolingian Empire. At the same time, however, this also points out the Italic Kingdom's re uh, relevance. Charlemagne conferred the royal title for Italy 
on Pippin's son Bernard. So still showing care for the what was the legitimate bloodline, but you know Pippin was in fact would be the the at least after the death of the first brother uh, Charles, the, um, the the in fact the the first ruler of the empire, right? Um, Louis II was there, but at that point would have probably split it. Well, Charlemagne still recon by, by recognizing Louis as so ruler of the empire, still maintained the Italian crown for Bernard. Um, thus, the separate identity of the former Longbar kingdom was confirmed, right, as a, as a war. Uh, it took some decades, as we'll see now, for uh, for the Italic kingdom to recover some kind of a real royal autonomy, because these titles were often, sometimes, at least, especially in this case, not really held by rulers who lived directly in Italy, and that's perhaps why the burner thing in Charlemagne's um, testament. But um, the, the the broader unity of the kingdom would be ultimately preserved. And it was also the one that underwent less swings because the other partitions, politically, ethnically, um, north of the Alps were, were less obvious and they swung more. After his succession in 814, Louis de Pius allowed Bernard to keep the title of king but also proclaimed the Longobard kingdom dependent on the imperial authority. Right? It was important not to create uh, direct fractures to reaffirm that, of course, hierarchically speaking, the emperor was also ruling on the king of Israel, even if it didn't sum up the, the crowns. Uh, individually, personal, at that point. However, a rebellion from Bernard in 817 that was pushed also by some of the same uh, Carolingians uh, that in Italy, but also in kind of core lands of of the of Franken that drag also would drag on a broader opposition uh, against Louis de Pius was soon repressed. Right, Louis and trusted the control of the kingdom to his elder son Lothar, whom he had already associated with himself in the rule of the empire. Louis de Pius had a very strong sense of continuity with the with his father's um, you know institutional system and with a properly great sense of the imperial dignity in itself. So he secured this um this arrangement by already appointing uh his son Lothar, as it had happened for his uh, brother Pippin with their father back in the day, thus stressing that the new ruler of the empire should have been both emperor and king of Italy. Lothar exercised his authority over uh, the kingdom for more than 10 years without actually living there right? and without even adopting the title of king himself, right? Purely, uh, he owned it, let's say, because um, of, of, the, of the strength of his imperial dignity, right? It was becoming, in this sense, O1, right? There is some debate historiographically about this because the Annales Regni Francorum hint at uh, Corona Regni, so conferred by the Pope, on Lothar, um, which has been interpreted at the point also as the 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 crown of, of the kingdom of Italy, but this doesn't indicate with any certainty actually the crown of the Longbirds. Renium, as you know, is um, is also an used as a synonym of of the same imperial rule at a point. So um, there was a certain ambiguity. I made. Uh, about the terminology, I made a video also about this recently. If you go in the Carolingian Europe playlist, you will find everything. So, if you're curious, that's uh, that's really 
that's really an important point because there were still lots of things that were to be settled, right? Up to Louis the P is also the concept, for example, of imperial crowning by papal hands was was not fully um, confirmed, right? He was the one who would actually do that um, for for good, right? And so also connecting in that sense the Longobard crown to the imperial crowning in the process. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, the, let's say, paradoxically enough, um, it was Lothar's political career which would uh, lead to the confirmation of the independent existence of the Kingdom of Italy, having come into conflict with his father over the the unity of the empire and also the hereditary rights of his brothers it was the, always again the same old problem Lothar was forced to live in Italy more or less permanently for 10 years this is to say from 829 onwards and you know what the deal was right uh, also the Lotharingia and so the broader association of the um, the land stretching from, from the North Sea to, to the to the Alps um, plus Burgundy and the Longobard Kingdom as this broader um, privileged kind of center of the empire in including the two imperial capitals Rome and Aachen and instead Western Francia and Eastern Francia um, to be given to, to, to their brothers we're talking about severe you know wars also taking place the, the, the bloodshed of Fontenoy um, really so um, in, in this sense, uh, the, the much less turbulent nature of this Halic kingdom provided Lothar with, with a safe heaven. And it was, um, after all, uh, um, just a privilege, right, to be able to rule from Pavia, by the way, because this, the, the, the Longobard capital remained, uh, the, also the Carolingian one, there were all the, the central offices, the Palatium, Regis, all the administration, the as we were saying before, the, the quite orderly and functional Italic kingdom, and it was also strategically important because it was just south of the Alps, so there was an important capacity of intervention elsewhere, except um, not really on on the Italian base that, as we've seen, was essentially less functional than the Frankish heartland in terms of political and strategical. Uh, projection, right? Because the, the the local communities were differently organized, but still, it was kind of an unassailable position from the side of the other the other brothers. Also, as you know, Lotharingia in the north would lose its own uh, coherence. It would be battle on between the western and eastern Franks. Eventually, it was the latter that would extend, at least nominally, a control on it. Um, also, Burgundy was quite um, attracted, especially from from Italy, as we've seen in, the, in those videos about the Kingdom of Burgundy. So, um, there were lots of issues here that are not even entirely strategical, but s exquisitely political that made history going in another direction compared to various possibilities. And Lothar was, as we've seen, he didn't feel match the kind of his Longbird royal role or, or tradition, right? He didn't identify himself as a uh, as a Longbird king. Nevertheless, the continuous presence of the sovereign whose sphere of activity was de facto limited to the Kingdom of Italy gave back to the country a kind of a life of its own. And under Lothar and also his firstborn son, Louis II, especially, there was a big deal also of, con of expansion from within the same Italy, for example, towards the south, um, against the Saracens. It was a, a very interesting um, display there of, of the, the former Longobard kingdom political and military capacity as, as the unit that also the, the Carolingians had preserved, but also endowing it, however, with part of that kind of vassalatic beneficiary nature that was so developed north of the Alps and that in this sense did privatize further the system kind of in, in the, the 
saying Carolingian times were public authority of the monarch was was eroded, right? And you know that the Italic Kingdom, in the long run, as it would survive, for example, differently from the the Burgundian one, but um, it, it wouldn't have from from the beginning of the 11th century any kind of native sovereign uh, anymore. So um, because it it they had had it, but they also had never really managed to control the entire kingdom after the the end of the Carolingians as well. So we will hopefully talk about that phase of history that we didn't make too many videos on. Actually, I think nothing at all until the Ottonians arrived. Um, the m resolution in 839 of Lothar's quarrel with his father marked um, a new confirmation of Italian autonomy for probably as part of the settlement Lothar's firstborn son Louis II was appointed king for Italy right? and it would be a very long lasting ruler and a fairly effective one in 844 Louis was sent to Rome to be anointed to to receive the crown of the Longobards from the same Pope right so thus confirming this uh, at the end of the day local uh, continuity because at the time fundamentally the Carolingians controlled also the the papal state right because of that ambiguity existing between what was uh, the churches and what was the the emperors but the fact of coexisting there was an important um, uh, for example multinational character of Rome at this point were important Frankish communities uh, next to the also more traditional the same Longobard ones that had existed even the Anglo-Saxon ones since the time of Gregory the Great the various scholar that um, also protected the city against the Saracens etc um, this this is another story but let's say there was also a, a change of the Roman tradition to um, to include fundamentally the new uh, th these new elements uh, these new ethnic elements in the political and uh, juridical landscape right and um, and the connection with uh, with the, the Carolingian Empire at this point could not really be disconnected right this was much more of a Carolingian dominated reality than any thing that the the Byzantines could that point still hope to 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 maintain with the papacy you know, right up to the 12th century the, the Roman pontiffs were very shrewd to play always on both contendants in a sense by maintaining also ultimately the papal um, de facto independence now although Lothar maintained control of Italy through his imperial authority as well, because he was from the Treaty of Verdun, as you know, emerging. He, he was, you know, unchallenging that imperial title was just mostly a matter of on which lands the the various brothers should have ruled. Right, he was also, and de facto, most importantly, king of Italy. That was the center of his power. Um, nor Lotharingia nor Burgundy provided him with any sound base so yes it was mostly uh, an italic based thing um, and this also brought the existence of the italic kingdom as a separate entity within the Carolingian world and the post Carolingian one never again called into question right the, the unit no, nobody ever thought to partition Italy anymore uh, the kingdom remained the same one right until until Napoleon right uh, there weren't changes of sort if not some kind of border kind of expansion especially the, the negotiation with the papacy right was mostly an internal thing to central and partly also northern Italy regarding what was the popes what was but the the boundaries are also kind of obvious right they are the Alps so th there is not much of a of a complication there if not maybe in the further east like in areas like Istria um, etc I made recently also a video about the 
the mark of uh, Friuli or medieval Friuli in general that mm, speaks of that eastern frontier that as we will see was quite important for the Carolingians as well and so an important degree of action right before and after these times historically um, eventually Louis the second definitely confirmed this kingdom's unity as well and was perhaps the most um, kind of that point also towards the end of the, Carol the, the late Carolingian era right showing that that crown had that specific uh, area right and that what was happening also north of the Alps was of relative uh, importance for the rulers of, of Pavia many aspects of the Carolingian government of Italy up to Lothar depended the internal rule of the kingdom however many aspects of the Carolingian government of Italy up to Lothar depended on the role the kingdom played within the empire as well mostly because of, of the imperial crown either you know, still conferred by, by the Pope you know, where another so at least at a certain point the Carolingian emperor had uh, either because of his father or himself had ruled in acquired the title in a context where the the direct rule on Italy had been secured right and without that you couldn't reach Rome so it's simple as that right that's the reason why eventually the ether was maintained throughout all at the Holy Roman Imperial history um, strategically too this was a newly conquered land so underwent all the problems of the invasions uh, the Carolingian invasions I mean the um, the relations with with their neighbors that the the Franks also were essentially at war with as in, in, in great part the same longbirds had been right in the same the same intent right so uh, part of the reason why the kingdom was stabilized so so easily is, is because its strategic function didn't fundamentally uh, undergo any significant change with the Carolingian conquest. More or less, uh, the 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 game was was the same. On s on several fronts, the boundaries of the kingdom coincided also with those of the same empire. In fact, for that reason especially the ancient enmity between the Longbirds and their eastern neighbors the others was simply inherited by the Carolingians who had a common border with the others in Bavaria as well so there was a, a lot of coordination naturally between especially northeastern Italy and southeastern Germany so much that at a point later on in the 10th century as you know Bavaria included the same part of those same uh, Italian lands administratively in, in the empire then it was reverted consider that Bavaria was a bit in the same situation because uh, yes it had been created by the Merovingians back in the day but it had as we were saying before always kind of tried to escape the Frankish orbit also siding with Italy so securing again Bavaria also expanding um, the, the it with the creation of the new marks we made uh, we explained that in, in the video about the Dutch of, of Austria itself uh, meant that um, that land to also acquire a very important strategic role in fact Bavaria with Regensburg was the actual center of the Eastern Frankish monarchy as well and there from between Bavaria and and uh, the Longobard kingdom you have the Brenner Pass, which historicals would be the one the the Eastern Germanic uh, rulers would use, in fact, to, to descend into Italy, um, as opposed to, to the Carolingians, who were mostly Western-based. Um, so there were connections there, also militarily speaking, right? Um, there were s some rebellions in Italy. Today we do not talk about them, but this happened 
importantly, at the same time, the, Sa the, the Carolingians were waging war against Saxony. Charlemagne himself had to rush south. Uh, and we, we talked about that, that in, the, in the, in fact, in the aforementioned video about medieval Friuli. But we m must ha make a bit about that, the battle of the Livenza River, the controversies about that battle, which nobody understands really won. And uh, the Friulian autonomies, in a sense, were, were maintained, as we will see in a while. So there was also the Slavic threat at a point when the Avar Khaganate was crushed. The, we talked about this, especially in the video about medieval Croatia, about the Duchy of Croatia, and also the Byzantine infiltration in areas like Istria, Dalmatia, and even in part some proxy war finance uh, along in fact, the Slavic continental populations were a concern for 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 the Franks like the, the Bavarians the Friulans had to wage war multiple times also suffering important reverses against this terrifying uh, Croatian plateaus uh, that were full of forests hill forts um, guerrilla like so there were the Pannonian Slavs as well in many ways a completely different world from the the other side of the Alps but still connected with it um, now in in southern Italy the Duke of Benevent Arrakis the son-in-law of the last Longobard king Desiderius had escaped the Frankish conquest thanks to the sheer distance of the duchy from the theater of military operations. Benevent is entrenched in the in the mountains, in the Apennines. It controls also other important passes uh, along the coast that, as you know, in the interland is mostly all mountainous. So think about Salerno, right, where the the duke uh, built a an important rock that eventually, like, is famous mostly for the later Norman castle, but it's uh, was an important bulwark and stronghold. Um, rendered extremely complicated um, strategically and logistically a uh, uh, Carolingian invasion and permanent conquest. This had been a bit the problem of the same Longobard kingdom, except the Duchy of Benevent, contrary to, as we were saying before, what historiography thought up to a certain point, was absolutely um, supportive of the U the unity of the Longobard kingdom as such. Just, you know, it enjoyed a decentralized position, was more autonomous. Um, but also on multiple occasions the, um, the the Longobard royal army had appointed, had marched up there um, appointing local dukes that however since in the Longobard tradition were elected um, at, at their death would normally be substituted by somebody of of the local nobility's choosing, right? As we will see, this paradoxically facilitated, in fact, the Frankish government in Italy because uh, the Longobards didn't have that kind of dynastic, essentially feudal reality where, you know, that was just um, uh, the sentence from Francis. So everything was elective, from from the monarchy to down to the uh, to the ducal power that. In, especially in, in the most advanced areas of the kingdom had been essentially substituted by the one of the royal Gastaldi that were essentially public administrators that also could be more controlled by the crown. Um, but the, the Beneventan Longbirds at that point were the only last uh, true uh, hairs of the independent kingdom. I also made a video about the so-called, in fact, Langobardia Minor, which was this broader kind of southern Longobard reality in the, in, yes, in central southern Italy that uh, went on, in fact, up to the Norman conquest as a as international polity, also of some, in fact, relevance considering it was just in between the Carolingian and the Byzantine empires that they always played to their own advantage. Initially um, these rulers were still calling themselves as dukes then eventually they assumed the title of princes um, and uh, I also talked about them in the video about the Saracens I don't remember which one but uh, 
describing also what was their broader relation with the, with the foreign powers. Um, Charlemagne succeeded in making Arrakis recognize his hegemony, but was not able to exercise any effective authority over Benevent. Uh, this was also kind of normal. I mean, the, the, the Beneventans were not much of a threat to the unity of the kingdom per se. The main, the main problem was that they were seeking the support, and in part because of the same reason, because the Carolingians were the overwhelmingly more, uh, more powerful reality. Uh, so the support of the Byzantine Empire, right, and they did fight the Franks along the borders, right. So. That was mostly for keeping them out and for exploiting this kind of constant, uh, you know, nego co competition between the two powers to 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 gain the the favor of the Beneventans. The the Tyrrhenian coast was also gradually acquiring the characteristics of a frontier. Because of the attacks carried out by the Saracens from the beginning of the 9th century, um, this had already been going on. Um, as you know, we made a video about Islamic Sicily. This had started with, with Sicily. And with, um, at least in terms of direct conquest, right? the, the Longobards had actually coped in part with um, Saracen piracy. Lutprand had also recovered some important relics that had been um, looted by the by the pirates in, in Sardinia, even though Sardinia was not a part of the Longobard Kingdom, while Corsica it was, and so it was also part of the Carolingian one. So the Tyrrhenian island, so uh, yeah, the islands, the Tyrrhenian Sea, came to be infested by this piracy. First Sicily, then Sardinia, and eventually Corsica. Corsica depended administratively on Tusha, that would be essentially Tuscany uh, in the Longbird Kingdom. We, we don't know when the Longbirds actually conquered Corsica, but it happened likely, especially after the. You know, the the, the Longbirds themselves had always had some. They had, they were essentially a terrestrial power, but they also carried out their own piracy. Right when they settle in the uh, in along the Tuscan coast and places like Pisa, etc., they they even seized some Byzantine dromons. They they start started launching offensives in in the late sixth century against the same Sardinia. And at a point, we know the Corsica simply belonged to them. We we have um, charters of important Longobard Tuscan Longobard landowners. Um, having possessions both in Tusha and in Corsica and you know that speaks it all including bishops that were called for war incidentally because of the Carolingian invasion um, so that shows you that also that there was a, a similarity even in the actually in the military organizations and the equipment again the main difference between the Carolingians and the other Latin Germanic powers is was in, in the essentially professionalism of, the, of their elite Right, if you look at their equipment, their organic, it was completely the same. So it was essentially smaller powers with a less professional military system versus, again, the Franks. There were something else entirely, but in, in the practice, they were of, of warfare, of, you know, of military culture were pretty much the same. The Saracen raids eventually went against the Italian mainland as well. Well, um, throughout all, especially in central, uh, in, especially in southern Italy, they at some point they arrived to to pillage even the to plunder the uh, the, the the basilicas of Saint Peter and Saint Paul in Rome, the Abbey of Farfa, etc. So they went deep in land. They they by establishing their bases in um, also in Provence, they threatened, like they, they at least they raided Piedmont. They even reached Germany uh, through the through the Rhine Valley. Interestingly enough, um, 
so this is a problem that the uh, the Carolingians had to cope with uh, importantly and you know especially the aforementioned devastation of the uh, the, the the apostles basilicas was seen especially for an a Roman Christian emperor like the Carolingian one as great uh, divine warning or punishment to say the least um, so there were interesting measures uh, uh, Louis II took even in the fortification of Rome and such things um, they will have to well kind of in detail on those topics because they're very important but nobody really discusses them in any case it, it was just piracy right it was never like the threat of invasion or conquest or whatever right but for the Tyrrhenian Sea that is the the Tyrrhenian coast of, of, of the of, of the kingdom that was the the most devil right the one uh, with milder milder weather greater population greater agricultural output and in fact greater international especially maritime connections as well this this piracy was quite impacting in many ways and you know that all the Carolingian kingdoms in fact dealt uh, albeit in different measures all of three of them dealt with all three the enemies Magyars, Saracens and Normans right now the defense of the borders of the Longobard kingdom was thus essential not only for the maintenance of control in Italy at least in front of the communities because there was always the risk of kind of disgregation by a certain degree is what the Carolingians were fighting against uh, throughout all their, their entire domains but also to confront in fact forces which were essentially hostile to the Empire the Carolingians thus maintained the uh, the provincial structure of the Longobard duchies of Friuli and Spoleto they also increased the authority and lands of the Duke of Lucca and they created essentially a substantial duchy in Tusha too right these were all previous Longobard districts uh, duchies actually uh, that uh, had been historically functional also at the time of the wars against the Byzantines as, as or in fact as frontier areas the, the, the Longobards maintained as we'll see now th this title of duchy whereas the Franks mostly chose the, t the title of counts but the the ancestral kind of militaristic mentality of, of the Longobards you know, stuck in that regard in these areas that had remained a bit the ones of frontier the one of Friuli, we have seen it, was essentially the, the one of the hardest Longobard stock and tradition and legacy and and uh, identity, let's say. And it, it, it substantiated itself greatly of the same struggles against the Avars, the Slavs, with which they were frequently at war, so securing also for the broader kingdom the, um, the eastern flank, right? It was the so-called Longobard Austria. So in the east, uh, whereas the Neustria, just like in the in the Frankish one, was was in the west, mostly today's Lombardy, Piedmont, right? So where the capital Pavia, so Milan, were, etc. Um, then Spoleto, as we were saying before, was this Apenninic power that had been quite ambiguous in his allegiance to to the kingdom. They had sided with the with with the Exarchs of Ravenna, and they had a an important proximity to Rome that was uh, strategically quite influent as we'll see now um, they were essentially in fact also the, um, the truly southernmost Carolingian direct possession because essentially the papal states at least from Ravenna etc they as uh, the, the popes would have liked it to, to extend but in important areas, in fact, also the Apennine made the Dutch located beyond it, right? You, the, you had to cross papal territory to reach Spoleto. And so was, this was especially evident in later times where the, the papal state consolidated further. But it would be still historical, in fact, an imperial Dutch. 
the Duchy of Lucca was also quite important because um, Lucca is famous to any early medievalist er, um, for the the extraordinary archives that were maintained in fact, from from early high medieval times intact. Um, it was an important Roman city that was in fact even m more so in, in, in Longobard times. It had these important connections, as we were saying before, also with Corsica, partly with the north, uh, and could help organizing the, in fact, a broader Tuscan uh, power. The Dutch of Tusha too was, was quite relevant. It also controlled um, the frontier with, with the Papal States as well. It was not directly controlled, so um, the the Apenninic and Papal bordering areas were also lands of ancient militarization since the the Longobard settlement in the peninsula. So th the local communities were also just uh, framed in that uh, direction for cooperating with, with the Franks along the, the same strategic lines. Right? Um, these border districts took on the nature and functions of the marches of the Frankish political system. The Carolingian emperors chose their dukes from among the nobles they trusted the most and kept them under direct control regardless of the presence of a sub-king in Italy, relevantly enough. Inefficient dukes were replaced by other nominees and the force were made to provide them with adequate troops for campaigns beyond the border. Um, as we will see now, the Carolingians both used former Longbird and new Carolingian dukes, right? Um, they, especially in this frontier areas, they didn't use an iron fist because they knew that this duchies also had an important military potential that they wanted to co-opt and not to trigger against them. Um, and so given the aforementioned elective nature of the duchy, they would just wait for the original dukes to die uh, in order eventually to install uh, other dukes of their own preference, also from, from the local ones, but mostly, at least in the most important, uh, importantly strategical areas, in, uh, especially in Lombard, in Tuscany, etc., the um they, they would settle their own military retinues like frankish troops were properly settled with uh with uh, at the head of uh trusted noblemen as we will see the alamanni and the burgundians especially because of the proximity with italy so having more interests in common in a sense but also some of the flower of the carolingian nobility from northeast france right was was settled in Italy because they had to maintain really direct control and they had to be trustees of, of the emperor. But that's how important the uh, the kingdom really was. And the Longbirds participated, in fact, as the other Carolingian subjects to the imperial campaigns. Very often. Uh, Longobard dukes were, were sent with their own retinue, so picked ones also participating in the various campaigns in, 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 in the rest of the Carolingian world, like against the Avars, especially even that they were again in the northeast, so functional for that, but also at greater distances, right? And this shows also their capabilities, etc. But mostly, and obviously, their employment would be at kind of um, closer range. The Duke of Spoleto was made a permanent representative of the emperors for the protection of the popes in Rome. Right? Spoleto was close to Rome. It was also an essentially strategic position and from there on the frontier the, 
the local duke could measure for the Carolingians the thermometer of quite an, an important area between the papacy, Benevent, the Byzantine Empire, um, the rest of, of the Longobard Kingdom, uh, etc. When Carolingian kings were appointed for Italy, therefore, as it had happened under Charlemagne himself, this happened uh, more for dynastic than for strategic reasons, as we all see. This was part of the broader Carolingian family issues, what they, um, you know, how they, they would play themselves at cards is this um, this European regions um, but local kings definitely once settled uh, in in the in the country helped to control the activity of the public officials they were keeping to carry on their own duty and to gain consensus from the local populace um, as um, Carolingian king was ideologically bound to keep justice to protect uh, the feeble in his kingdom as well right the if you read the Carolingian capitularies issued in Italy uh, there is a very interesting attitude because these are Franks coming from northern Europe they are essentially new right uh, and they are in charge at the same time and they ask the local communities to tell them how they were habituated to 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 rule um, so that they would have to to provide with that as well right it, it's obvious that the first most important concern revolves around the uh, maintenance of the city walls of the of the bridges um, these were all very important infrastructures that during the time of the conquest had been left abandoned because of, of the vacancy of, of, of power of the, in the instability brought etc so the Carolingians were immediately to secure those also because it, uh, as we were seeing that talking about Roman cities stone walls stone bridges I mean something that uh, was really quite a, a bulky and uh, quite effective infrastructure if properly managed, right? So, uh, already in Longobard times, this that were specific tasks and duties regarding this or the local administration, etc. As regards military activity, Pippin's role basically consisted in supporting the frontier wars of the dukes in the marches as well. So, those wars uh, were, were going on. Uh, still by, by themselves and the Carolingians comforted the, the local duchies in that uh, in that effort. Louis II at first performed the same duty under Lothar, right? There were also long range expeditions throughout all the uh, latitudinal length of Italy across the Apennines by the way that under Louis II, right, the, the Carolingian Italic army performed uh, well right with local resources local administrative system scoring important results also you know over the Byzantines against the the, the Saracens so sh showing really the the capacity so the, the functionality of the Longobard kingdom um, here we come to the point of, in fact, the, the political name and the ethnic identity of the country because um, one problem for the Carolingians was the role that the Longobards themselves would have had in the kingdom. Uh, if it would have not been possible for the Franks to obliterate the identity of the Longobards, who, after all, were the majority of the population in the country. Right? Italy was known abroad by the Arabs, by the same Franks, by any, any trial, as Langobardia, right? The same, the Byzantines as well. There were Byzantines, that is, Romans, also under Longobard rule, especially after the conquest of Ravenna that had occurred in the late phase of, of the kingdom. So uh, the people there had remained legally Roman, they had their own customs about which we know very few 
you know, in theory, they should have followed the Corpus Juris Civilis, but uh, that didn't seemingly circulate much. And the Longobards, at that point, acted as protectors of the the Romans, right? And they also began to mint coins, kind of the Roman way in Ravenna, etc. And uh, the 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 most obvious direction was also taking over Rome, as we were saying. So they, the late Longobards had been thinking about how to cope with that, but they never Romanized their own, their own polity, right? The institutional cultural identity of the kingdom was Germanic. And all the subjects, essentially, in, in, the, in the Longobard occupied territories had become juridically Longobards. Right. Um, so this went on, right? In spite of the also the best efforts of these rulers, because Italy was, as we've seen, uh, the, the more comprehensive, also kind of geographical identification of the land, and it was very functional for asserting the empire's rule on the entirety of it. Also, against the Byzantines were claiming for it, but as you know, the Lombards, kind of in the Middle Ages, and you know a lot of street uh, uh, nomenclatures and all over uh, the continent still today uh, bear witness to this, the, 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 the quarter of the long, but they were fundamentally the Italians. Maybe these people were Tuscans or, you know, other non-Lombards, technically speaking, but abroad they were known as the Lombards because of the Longobard legacy. And, and yes, there was a, a kind of equivalency in also broadly Surely, in in, com in in language, in spoken language like the Langobardia, historically like the the Po Valley, more or less extended, depending on the the times, the you know the the broader uh, ethnographic um, you know, interpretations was was that right was not really really challenged and and it came to identify by by approximation also the same Italic kingdom right um, so this is no easy topic terminologically speaking from an historical point of view because uh, the sources have all their own you know way of defining especially the broader concept of Italy but the longbirdiness of it all was somewhat non uh, non debatable right uh, even the longbird law survived in an I don't know, even in, in the south, up to the 19th century, where there were still in the ancien regime some literal longbird laws that were still standing. Right? So um, it's an interesting yet complex topic. Um, as king of the longbirds, Charlemagne, to some extent, took on the duty of acting as their protector as well. Right, uh, it was just more actually uh, a greater, uh, a greater meaning than that. Uh, a big deal in the process was the preservation of the Longobard national law. That, as we've seen, was also very uh, effective. I made a video about Gothic Longobard and Frankish law in Italy. Because these, uh, especially the latter two, had come to overlap. The Gothic one didn't quite exist anymore, but there were some excerpts of the older Gothic um, laws that were integrated also in, in some miscellane that were um, essentially to be enforced. In fact, in, uh, as customary law in Italy next to the Carolingian and later Ottonian and other imperial capitularies. And in fact, the same revival of Roman law started from the Longobardist jurists who were quite scientifically advanced and were essentially trying not to substitute Roman law to their own, but just using it to, um, to, to fill those gaps in, in, in the same, in the same law that included in fact also feudal law etc not just the longer one and that brought instead to the revival of roman law in the entire west so uh, the longobard juridical legacy was massive to say the least um in in the history of european law 
in general. Um, however, the Longobard ruling class, as we were saying before, was gradually removed from public positions. Their places were taken by the aforementioned Frankish, Alamannic, and Burgundian aristocracy, who had come in with the Carolingian conquest, and these people were, in fact, the forefathers of great part of the Italian feudal nobility later on, and, uh, uh, you know, there were also other Germanic connections in Ottonian times, and more in general with the other imperial officials that were appointed in Italy did the same uh, there was a lot of back and forth. For example, the Welfen dynasty was the one of Este, the one struggling against Frederick Barbarossa in Germany. Because those had other Germanic origins in turn. This was a very important thing for the Italian nobility later on. We have seen it even for for Dante, that boasted Germanic origins. The Alighieri is this Germanic etymology, the same Cavalcanti from the French. So the idea was that Yes, these Germanic rulers back in the day had been the, uh, in fact, the establishment. And so there was a, a, de a degree of, of nobility connected with their legacy, right? Also, modern Italian does bear witness of the Carolingian phase. So the, the Longobard uh, lexicon is stronger, but uh, the, there are names like Bernard, like other, that are, in fact, coming from that specific Frankish non Longobard background. Um, and so most of the rulers that also played uh, with the Italic crown in the following centuries, seizing even imperial titles, but just ruling from from the various marks of uh, and duchies of Italy without any other broader ambition, were all part of this broader net uh, and um, of Germanic nobility. Uh, the, as we were also saying before, the Alemanni, or Alamanni and the Burgundians were prominent elements here. The Burgundians had shared the fact of the empire with the Franks in in an ethnic sense because we're talking about I mean the Burgundians as a polity had been knocked out even more than the Alamanni but ethnically speaking it's the Frankish Burgundian regions to form the, the core of, of the of the Frankish empires so mostly the, the westernmost part but the Alamanni were also historically connected with Italy after all their migration in the Swiss Alps was due to the to the alliance with the gods of Theodoric after Clovis had defeated them at, at the Battle of Tolbiac and they, they were settled there in a kind of military function as federati of the gods in, in, in a sense. And, and they were just across the Alps. So that connection later on, the Alemanni was all, were also the one from which, you know, the Hohenstaufen would descend from the same, actually the same Hohenzollern, the, the Habsburgs, they all have that kind of uh, essentially Alemannic Swiss uh, background, right? So um, the proximity, the, the strategic proximity of Swabia to Italy w was was especially with Lombardy, as we've seen before, Bavaria with with the northeast and uh, Swabia with Lombardy was connecting these centers. And as you know, the broader kingdoms of Germany and Italy would be connected eventually as an axis. Uh, with the Ottonian revival, the so-called Holy Roman Empire, that, however, was still the same uh, Roman Empire of the Carolingians. Um, so these men came in arms, right? This is, this is important to stress. They they brought their their retinues. They were trustees of the imperial court. And, and were appointed naturally also to the judicial districts of the kingdom. With the titles of counts, dukes, and marchiones, that is to say, marquises. Others were settled properly as royal vassals, also in a greater number, to control strategic points in the kingdom. Right? This had been a thing also during the migration era, right? The, the gods, the longbirds had in fact, established themselves in very specific places. In fact, there was a continuity also with the uh, 
uh, as we were saying before, with certain specific Carolingian settlement and the, and the Longbird one. I mean, the, the broader Carol Frankish migration was not massive, ethnically speaking, but it, it was aimed right, at very specific places. They, um, they, they provided with the counts, with, with armor support, the replacement of Longbird officials was almost complete by 800, um, but the influx of Frankish vassals, officials, and ecclesiastics too continued after Charlemagne's death. Uh, the last substantial wave of um, Frankish nobility uh, to settle in Italy occurred in 834, when many noblemen that had supported Lothar followed him into exile de facto in, in Italy and rewarded, were rewarded by him with possessions there for their loyalty. The imposition of the Franks as the governing class went with the also partly elimination of Longbert tradition as at least the political ideology of the kingdom. That, that was relevant. Um, the kingdom had been shattered, right? The uh, late, l the very late Longbird rule had been ineffective enough for the Carolingians to take over, and they were both causes and consequences. Then, are the same thing, because otherwise, up to you know the, the mid eighth century, the Longbirds had had an effective government. And although Pippin and Louis II bore the official title of Kings of the Longbirds, in fact, the Frankish sources, normally, not always, but still uh, meaningfully, refer to them as Kings of Italy. Mm. And as we were saying before, the, the, the purpose is, is very obvious, right? The name Italy could essentially take the place of Longbirdy and thus cementing also a greater even a greater compaction over the also in fact the non Longbird elements of the kingdom. The Romans as well, right? Especially that were the the minority part of the population, but still in important areas like Ravenna, like Rome, right? So not places where you could really uh, do without them and in fact th there was a general effort to um, let's say to make this various juridical identities cooperating um, we'll see this perhaps in another video but if you v see what, what happened after the, the Carolingian conquest is that much of the socio-economical situation had been shattered and um, also the the difference between Romans and Longobards in practical juridical terms had been blurred also because the same Longobards in their late legislation had you know intelligently accepted the possibility of uh, striking deals for example with I don't know the Roman law even among say two Longobards and or uh, you could be in like at, in court you could ask to be judged according to for example the Frankish law where you were maybe a, uh, a Roman living in in uh, in what had been Longobard Ravenna you in Carolingian times you wanted to be judged um, you could choose what kind of law you wanted to go by as a Frank as well um, so th this is very interesting because the difference I, I, on a strictly theoretical level, never came less, right? There was a specific Frankish law, there was a specific Longbird law, a specific Roman law, or at least certain specific customs that, according to which, uh, that also, at least the best documented ones are the, the Frankish and the Longbird one, but, the, you know, in, in practice, also the, the ruling class would try to simply blend, uh, to merge these various identities on a on a practical level, which is what would happen on the long run. Also because, as we were saying, these laws were already studied in a kind of comparative sense. Uh, plus, 
the, um, uh, the, the, the economical revival, especially in a country like Italy that, in, that had a lot of monetary circulation compared to the rest of the empire, etc., was w would just blend all these um this would need ever more innovative forms of contracting of you know business management etc so uh, something different it is essentially uh, almost a, a protocommunal uh tamper in that degree of economic dyna uh, dynamism so this started a bit with the Carolingian Congress, where the also that broader idea of Longobard rule was over, because at least the Franks now were were in charge. Um, even in a capitulary promulgated by Charlemagne in eight hundred and one, there is a reference to the provinces of Italy, so called, and this terminology derived from the Carolingian custom of indicating the various parts of the empire by geographical rather than ethnic name right um, for the same reason right you would speak of burgundia not not lands of the burgundians but who are the burgundians right it, it is true that you know that was some kind of historically different ethnic sustratum but essentially the it's the ruling class here that matters, and those are Franco Burgundians by this point, like just that are the Franco Lomanni, and, and here too you find essentially a blend between the Franks and the Longbirds by a degree. Um, and in this specific case, it um, effectively served the purpose of stressing the newness of the regime in Italy and of masking the kind of the, the Longbird roots of of the kingdom. It's also meaningful that from the reign of Lothar onwards, it also became customary for notaries to date documents according to the renal years of the sovereigns in Italy, which is a bit double-edged, because while recognizing that there is a, a Frankish imperial rule from the external into Italy, uh, it still basically states that this is a foreign domination and so that yes th we call it Italy now but remember that this is just a new thing right at least in in relation to the to, to what um, the establishment was before I, as I was saying before the same Longbirds stressed the kind of the Italianness of their rule geographically because they they really wanted to secure the control on the entire peninsula right but in this sense, uh, Italy sounded more now like a Carolingian province, right? A, fr a Frankish province rather than, and and this thing went on, right? It's like if you still think in, in the mindset of the French Renaissance kings, like for a Francis the first was radically obsessed with anything uh, Italian. He had a, an enormous um, humanistic library that also, you know, his. Uh, finance ministers tell that it costs too much, even for a, for a kingdom like France. He literally thought of Italy as an extension of France, right? And so this in typically, the f France is by far, with, without any doubt, and thankfully I would say, and because of the Carolingians, the single most imperialistic country in Europe, well, this idea does stem exactly from that mentality. It's brutally fascinating. Now, the prominence of Longobard Law was also reduced, uh, as you can imagine. First of all, there was the injection of Frankish law that, if anything, was, if you want a common uh, juridical language with, with, the, with the establishment that could be used by, by the same subjects. Um, the Carolingians obviously promulgated special laws for the Kingdom of Italy, on the wake of the, in fact, Longbert um, legislation in the guise of at least presenting it as a sort of continuation or completion of, of the same sometimes. But in general, these laws were intended to regulate a new situation. 
That was also the normal consequence of the conquest, again, in which people of different origins lived together in Italy and all had the right to call upon their own national law. And it was important for the Franks to stress this, because it would homogenize uh, would, would, um, the, the, the juridical practice, it would, through it, you know, bring closer kind of the, the Longobard uh, identity to the, the one of Carolingian subjects, right, more easily. Such legislation was still aimed, of course, at the free people, right? Um, however, these were no longer qualified as longbirds or arimanni, which means have men, uh, that, that is to say, the, the, the men of, of, of the army um, in the Latinized version. Um, under Lothar, they were described as, quote, the world populace living in the kingdom of Italy. Right, so stressing the the entirety, the if you want the universality of, of the message, politically speaking, and, and and correctly referring to also, of course, the Roman subjects and the same Frankish subjects that had come there to leave. So even the basis of legislative authority was new. Only in the earliest capitulary of Pippin is there any trace of the Longobard custom of promulgation in, the fr in front of an assembly, in which Franks already took part. Right, uh, The Longobards had, had such assembly to confirm even their own king's election. It was the ancient thing. Longobards' kings were elected according to the Germanic tradition, and this had withstood even the imposant institutional and administrative development of the king. Uh, it had worked without creating problems, even of division, civil wars or anything. Right, So it was to consider by the Franks if they wanted to rule uh, in a country that they were also kind of molding in their own feudal sense, but that was quite different from their own um, however, when you look at the Italian capitularies, you realize that they were prepared still on the basis of written instructions which arrived from across the Alps or else wherever the emperor was. Sometimes, well, they, they happened from within Italy itself, and that's why we're stressing the importance of Lothar's reign and also the one of Louis II. But in this sense, they were in this, especially in the early phase, um, extensions to Italy of decisions already taken in Francia, right? Which also shows again how much care the Carolingian rulers had to specifically address the Italic situation according to their planned vision of the same. Again, today, okay, perhaps we will not talk so much about strategy after all, but when we will also go more in detail in the various Carolingian expeditions in and from Italy, we will see why such care was so great. Um, on, on one occasion, Charlemagne imposed Frankish customs to supplement Longbird law. This was the essentially the only margin m medieval rulers had to, in conditions of great power, say to to issue some kind of new laws compared to one the customary ones of the peoples they ruled on that were just there in, ter in theory to 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 legitimize the, the sovereign through the, the defension of the same law, and so it's obvious that if the Longbird law hadn't dealt with a specific aspect, especially of the ones that were coming to exist in Carolingian point, the, the Franks would say, okay, well, we issue by law um, this, and essentially adding Frankish elements to the same Longbird law. And, and the thing continued because the, the capillaries are separated uh, laws from the Longbird ones, but they, they do follow the traditional structure of 
you know, single, in fact, capitularies, chapters, that in that specific Italic context were added to, say, functionally to the previous law. So I have to mention Longobard jurists also importantly cooperating with the uh, with the new establishment in this sense. The Carolingian legislation was in this sense royal and s supernational at the same time. The use of the Longobard law was allowed in so far as it did not conflict with the general political direction of the Carolingians. Right? Um, Naturally, there, there wasn't much of a broader ideological sophistication about that. The Longobards had ruled over a kingdom. Um, and as we were saying, their, their law was quite complex, but it, um, right, it, it, the Carolingians at this point were, were playing a bigger game than the Longobards, and so there, there was some you know, greater use of force, of imposition, forced by the necessities. And uh, the the norm the, the Longobard customs had to essentially to, to partially adapt to this. But again, we're talking of uh, a reality that had already modified uh, itself in these uh, generations. The institutional organization of the kingdom was modified too. The Carolingian government aimed at essentially homogenizing the Longobard administrative system through the office of the count. The count is, as we were saying before, like a, a new title to Longobard tradition. Only the Duchy of Benevent at a point used counts, or at least, at least there, there is um, can perhaps a, a bit more of a Roman influence to that in the local administration not just because of the uh, the proximity to the Byzantine eras, but be perhaps because the Benevent and Longobards had settled there even before the rest of the people of, as veterans of the Gothic War, as Federati, and they had absorbed earlier this title of Comus in Comitas. And the Franks had adopted the same instead and began to um, substitute it fundamentally to the, to the Longobard dukes, the duches you know, of the ducatus, as opposed to the comitatus. So, literally, this Carolingian counts took over functions and frequently the same districts of the Longobard dukes. Uh, they formed a new establishment, a new aristocracy, literally, of officials who derived their position from the Italic king's appointment, um, and this would have been similar to the Gassel date, we'll see in a while, that the Longobard kings had already been essentially uh, using in the same substitutive fashion, but without interfering too much with the ducal government, just when, you know, these dukes were, you know, died, eventually there was no... Uh, stable government for the successor the, the Gastaldus came came in from from Pavia from 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 the royal direction the the Frankish counts were however something different because as such they they had no previous organic ties with the communities they were governing so they were l real foreigners um such um, the same complexity of the Duke Gastaldius structure was reduced, right? Um, the the Gastaldi actually remained as public officials. They retained their original function as essentially administrators of royal fiscal estates, but they no longer posed themselves as an alternative representative of royal authority and substitute of the comital ducal one inside the kingdom right so they w they remain under um and interestingly enough in the broader 
uh, spread of feudalism in Italy after the Frankish conquest, they would become, especially during the 10th century, viscounts, right? Just like it was happening in the rest of post carolingian Europe. So there were simply some local appointees of the counts that over time would acquire maybe the same communal dignity themselves as it happened, right? It, this is this remains in the same, uh, you know, in the broader post Carolingian. Um, in fact, especially in French and, and Italian uh, governmental vocabulary, right? The idea of of the vicomte. Think about the Visconti in Italy that became actually Dukes of Milan and so on. Well, those the, the name does derive from this original role that probably some some ancestor of theirs had had as not necessarily as a Gastaldus, but also possibly, but still as some of these kind of autonomized. Um, subordinates of the counts that at, at a point had been in trust, I don't know, a castle of the count they had died or um, you know the district had changed so they, they eventually became maintained the title uh, viscounts but factually having the same power of some kind all other local officials with jurisdictional powers were considered from the very beginning of Frankish uh, domination as ministry of the counts so in other words, administrators um, deputed to the lesser things compared to the counts that equally, instead, conversely, uh, summed up a bit all the local uh, prerogatives of, of power after the, after the same king. So a bit like in France, as a matter of fact. We will talk more about for example, the church, the cities, and societies in general in Carolingian Italy in another video. For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.